Because unless we build awareness and continue to grow the, uh, <clears throat> the support for the work of WFP and the other organizations that are working to address the issues that we've been discussing, then we cannot move forward. It is the awareness, it is the drive, the public will to ensure that global leaders make the decisions that, for, that will benefit those who are most vulnerable. And without that public will that you can build through social media, we will not get that change. And finally, for WFP, it's also about raising funds. WFP is a 100% voluntary organization. And if we don't have the access and support that we receive from so many through social media today, we cannot raise the dollars that are required to ensure that we can deliver the support that so many need across the global community. And Hi, Commissioner Gutierrez. You spoke when we were, we were backstage a little about the, the numbers, the refugee numbers, and we have World Refugee Day coming up tomorrow, I believe. And I, in, in terms of dealing with those numbers and how, as you explained, climate change is impacting that, how is, it, how is the technology and the connectivity helping you? Well, uh, last year we had 800,000 new refugees in the world driven by conflict, which is the highest number in the century. And uh, at the present moment, today, we have three acute massive displacement crises by conflict. Syria, Sudan, South Sudan, and Mali, not to mention the Democratic Republic of Congo, not to mention all the old crises that go on and on and on and on, like Afghanistan or Somalia or Colombia. And so, I mean, we are overwhelmed. And doing business as usual, we cannot respond to this kind of challenge. We need to use new forms of managing our activities. You, we, used to, we need to use technology to empower people for them to be able to assume also the responsibility to find solutions. And technology is essential for that. Two or three examples. If you have solar lamps, you can allow young people to study in the evening in a refugee camp. If you have solar lamps in the streets, you have less women being raped during the night in refugee camps. At the same time, you can empower people by in Kenya, for instance, in Dadaab, uh, in a refugee camp, managing a bank account with a mobile phone. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, we need to use the potential of new technology in order to be able to deliver because we are overwhelmed by the challenges of the present, uh, 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 I would say, humanitarian problems in the world. We cannot face them doing, as I said, business as usual, and it's with partnerships with companies like uh, Ericsson or with uh, uh, the civil society organizations. It's with these kind of partnerships that we can multiply our efforts and we can not only address the protection needs and the assistance needs of people, but we can empower people to allow them to help, to help them to solve their own problems. I was going to say, we, we just took a, a question. I just uh, handed a, a question that we were taking over social media. You've answered it from, I believe, the, uh, the High Commission side. You know, and and from, the, from the private sector, it says, you know, why are partnerships between organizations and companies so important in organizations you know, like the United Nations, of course? And, and why is it important to Ericsson to, to partner with the United Nations? I think a partnership like this, as I said, we are all wanting to solve the biggest challenge on earth and we think our technology will bring it. And I think the UN organizations are working with many of them. So that's why it's so important that our technology will be used to solving those problems. That's important for our shareholders. It's important for our employees. It's important for our customers. So it, it goes hands in hand what we need to do. And I think uh, maybe a little example of that, which I think is Please. one of the most powerful examples uh, that I have seen lately, and that was the two Danish brothers that uh, lost a friend in, uh, that, uh, during his transition between different refugee camps. And um, they went to a refugee camp to try to find him, and they came to the refugee camp, and there were hundreds of refugees in the camp, and they started asking, are they here? And, and of course, it's hard to know who is in the refugee camp and start looking for them. And they came back and thought, we need to do something about that, that people that had lost each other during this transition of different refugee camps, they can find each other. At the same time, Ericsson, that basically had built 40, more than 40% of all mobile networks around the world, was raising the first mobile network close to refugee camp. So that surprisingly high amount of refugees has a mobile phone. Enormous many have a mobile phone. So together with UNHCR, 
and uh, Mr. Gutierrez, and, uh, and these two uh, Danish brothers, and Ericsson, and the mobile operator, we start to building a solution where actually you can start by using your mobile phone, find a refugees that you have lost by entering a lot of data about where I'm coming from, where, 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 where my neighborhood, etc. And just one number, you also get the feeling for it. In the, in the refugee camp in Kenya, you could probably process 700 of these requests a year when you do it manually, coming in and asking for a refugee. Today, we can, can do 650 a day. And in the last one and a half year, we have now more than 135,000 refugees that have signed up for the service to look for their friends, their relatives that have lost on this. And this can only be happening with the partnership of a public company like us, an operator, the great ideas from these young entrepreneurs, they want to find it, and also the cooperation of the UN organization. And uh, today we have reconnections where people find each other, and I think it's just amazing how the technology, the mobility, and a simple uh, solution on top of the network, an application, a social media, can start finding these refugees uh, and relatives they have lost. And, uh, I think it's just amazing, and we have other examples as well, but this was one that, for me, is so powerful about this partnership. Yeah. And, th and those are amazing stories, and, and amazing stories of, of connectivity and how social media is being used in, in refugee camps and in, in, in the camps I've, I've visited in Haiti, how, how many people are connected and using them to stay, to stay connected to families, whether they're, they're in country there or whether they're, they have family living overseas somewhere to just create a sense of community, it really is an amazing, amazing support system. Um, it, in the last few minutes we have left, uh, I w we're at this, throughout Real Plus Social, we've been kind of looking forward, looking at Real Plus 20 as, as where are we going to be in 20 years, not you know, looking back to, to 20 years ago here in Rio. So uh, my last question to, to all of you would be, you know, where would you like to see this in 20 years and how can technology help us get there to, to reach some of the goals that we hope are going to be established here, here at Real Plus 20? And I'll start with the executive director. Thank you very much. Again, <clears throat> let's go back to that child, that young girl who's, or the baby who's born today, who's 18 in 2030. That because of technology, we have the ability to create agriculture that has more drought resistant seeds that support more micronutrient rich diets so that she has the nourishment that she needs to grow both physically and mentally.